Yeah, okay. Well, thanks to, uh, thanks to everybody for waking the audience up in the morning. Uh, what a great opening act. Um, you know, I, I know very, very, very little about the hotels business. I mean, uh, as of today, I've just spent literally six months in this business. So it's a, I'm actually clearly starting off with a disadvantage. But maybe I'll, I'll try and kind of give an outside-in perspective because I do see a lot of similarities between what I did in the last uh, decade or so and, and what we are trying to do in the hospitality business, at least at, at OYO, the company that I, that I lead today. So I call this presentation or this session in pursuit of excellence because what I've realized over the last 10 years is that uh, business plans don't really work. They're almost as good as the time that it came out of the printer, and nothing ever, ever goes according to plan. So it's a constant journey. It's a constant journey towards excellence, and it's, uh, it's something that you're constantly pursuing without kind of quite knowing where the end game is. And maybe there isn't an end game. Um, so the very first thing is that, um, um, if I can get this thing to work, Maybe we can, this is certainly not working. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, what I always have said is that, you know, the opportunity is staring at us. For all the problems that are there in India and all the struggles that we have through bad traffic and, and inadequate infrastructure, there are very, very few places in the world today that are growing at the pace at which we are growing and with a population which is the largest in the world between the age of 18 to 35, which is willing to spend on, on experiences which are not buying cars anymore, which are not buying homes anymore, and therefore have much more expendable income to, um, to get a taste of what has been inaccessible all this while. I was listening to the, the three young men and women who were sitting over there and it, interestingly, they all came up with location, access, and, and experience. And, uh, and they assumed that as long as they have location and access, and they didn't want to travel two hours all the way, uh, then that would give them the right experience. And I'll keep, keep, that, keep that in mind because that's a bit of an explanation about what we are doing at OYO and how we're trying to kind of approach the whole business very, very differently from what has been done before. That, those three words have the answer to exactly what we are doing at OYO and more importantly, why we are doing so. Um, I hate to use the word disruption because I think it's a much abused term. Uh, I don't know whether we are disrupting anything, but we are certainly trying to approach it very, very differently, much like the inline business in the last 10 years that I was involved in. So um, there are uh, two, two Indias. And uh, this is not working, so you'll need to help me with that. So there are, there are two Indias. Um, there's the India that we live in, and there's this massive population of India which, uh, which has access to, to information now. They don't need to be literate. They don't need to understand English. And the information is already out there. It's only a question of whether we can find ourselves being relevant in that platform. Uh, last week, I was lucky enough to go to Geo and, and, uh, and spend uh, almost an entire day looking at all the great stuff that they're doing. And basically, again, the way they're solving for the, for the opportunity is they're saying, look, we don't care whether you know English or not. We don't care whether you have money or not. We will get you the information in the form that you need to use it, we'll make it relevant for you, and that's where we will have the most amount of opportunity. So I was complaining to them, saying that, you know, one of the problems that have happened in the last, you know, couple of months in the hotels business in India is that televisions are not working because of this new Supreme Court rule, and, and television channels are not accessible, and there's a big backlog to DTH connectivity. And they're like, why do you need that? I'm like, you know, because we, you know, this is our basic promise. We want to give television access to everybody. So he flips out this little phone, which looks like, a, looks like an old, you know, Nokia phone, one of those, you know, ones with the keypads. It's also a smartphone. It's available for free. 
because all you do is pay a security deposit. That security deposit comes back to you automatically in three years' time. They give you a little dongle with it. You attach that dongle into a HDMI cable on your hotel room TV. It's working now. This is not in the future. This is right now, happening right now. 670 channels and 100,000 hours of Hollywood and Indian movies. You don't need set-top boxes anymore. You don't need connections anymore. And that becomes your Wi-Fi dongle as you step out of the hotel and you're walking out, going and visiting tourist places. It's free. So the world is absolutely changing on us. It's only a question of whether we are relevant or not. It's not anymore looking for the market. The market is there. Am I moving fast enough to understand how I need to adapt my business to make it relevant for those customers who are already out there? India is a land of opportunity. Going back to uh, the business that I come from, the aviation business, this is a startling statistic. Less than all the, all the number of people who travel by air with all these fancy airlines in an entire year is less than the number of people who travel on the air-conditioned coaches of Indian railways in one day. So if you could convert one day's worth of traffic from the Indian air-conditioned railway coaches into air, you would need 600 new airplanes tomorrow morning. And next year, you will need 1,200 new airplanes. That is the scale of opportunity that is just going by. And we are not even, we are even, trying, we are not even trying to catch up with it because it's so large. Um, so when, when we look at, uh, you know, going back to 2006, and here's where I start seeing some of the comparisons with the business that we are in. 4th of August 2006 was the day when Indigo took its first flight, the airline that I, that I worked with for the past several years. And what was the situation at that time? Uh, we had a bunch of different, different brands uh, that were out there. One was this massive national carrier, which had been there for close to 100 years, actually 90 years, and which believed that service and, and more food, and more check-in counters, and more carpets, and bigger seats is what customers are looking for. Right. And then uh, there were a bunch of, of uh, new people who came in and, uh, and you know, started competing with each other, competing with this. And then they all came up with sort of similar products. And by the way, these are real hoardings. We've changed. We've made them change. We've not changed. These millions of dollars worth of hoardings and advertising and marketing forgot. We're still not talking about the customer, by the way. They're all talking about each other, right? I wonder whether in the business that I'm in today, we're also quite obsessed about what the other person is doing rather than what the customer wants. I don't know, maybe, right? And then, in all of this, suddenly came this revolution where somebody brought in access, one of the things that somebody said, and made it cheaper, just made it cheaper, right? And suddenly, their dream was to fly a billion people, which is a great revolution, but the point was that, again, we forgot about what the customer is actually needing, you know? What, what is it that the customer wants? And therefore, at that time, the perception was that low cost is low quality. Uh, people would land on a low cost carrier and just before exiting the terminal building, they would quietly tear off the baggage tag because you didn't want to show up in a meeting with a Air Deccan or an Indigo or a SpiceJet tag, you know? And, uh, and now I can see indigo cookie tins in most kitchens, how brands change. 
you know, how perception changes in a very, very short period of time, only a matter of 100 months. So our one big objective was to prove, and maybe even at OYO, it is to prove that low cost has nothing to do with low quality. That you can be ferociously cost conscious, you can give access at an incredible price, same as Geo is doing, same as Airtel did, same as Hindustan Levers did with its you know, shampoo sachets, and same as Indigo did, and maybe OYO is trying to do the same thing today. Where we have absolutely no shame in saying we're the most affordable, we want to suit your budget, and we'll create a location where you need it. You know, so when people start, you know, a business, a lot of the times they start ending up asking a question, what, is, what do customers want? But you know, the problem is that in our business, customers want a whole bunch of things. They want the, the massage and they want the spa and they want the frequent flyer points and they want the club lounges and they want the big lobbies and so on and so forth. The only problem is with customers at least certainly with my customers, maybe with yours too, and I've seen this over a decade, they just don't want to pay for it. <laughs> so the real question to ask is, what do customers need? And try to solve for that, rather than what do customers want? And uh, my, my previous uh, 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 founder, Rahul, used to always tell me, you know, Aditya, let's not try to create something where we are going to go and stay. Let's create something that the customer needs. You want to go fly first class, you know, go fly someone else. You know? And often, we forget who the customer is, what that customer needs, trying to make a deeply analytical you know, answer, get a deeply analytical answer to what that customer needs, what is that customer willing to pay for, and determine the whole business around that. Right? So uh, moving along. Um, you know, sometimes I'm often asked that why are we able to do what we're able to do? Or why were we able to do what we were able to do? Right? Uh, whether it was in the airline that I worked in or even today. Last month, OYO added, just in South Asia, 20,000 new hotel rooms into our system. Globally, we are adding about 60,000 new hotel rooms a month. Right? So why are you, why are you able to do what you're able to do? The answer to that is actually very, very simple. The answer to that lies in being boringly consistent. And that's a hard thing to do. The way the human brain is wired, we're always looking for that next new sexy idea. How many times do consultants walk through the boardroom and tell you about all the adjacent competencies that you must have and all the new things that you must start and new lines of business and so on and so forth. And we forget that customers want the same thing over and over again. And it is that trust and reliability that brings people back. And the biggest loyalty program that there is, is reliability. Look at yourself. Uh, I'm, most of you probably go to a beauty salon or a, or a barber shop. Not that you need to, you're all naturally good looking but uh, probably go back to the same place over and over again, and probably to the same person over and over again, right? Because you want to come out looking like you and not like me. You could find a place which is closer to your workplace, closer to your home, cheaper, more expensive, something that gives you a free soda, or something that's ridiculously cheap and, and inexpensive, but you keep going back to the same person over and over again because of that trust and reliability that that person brings along. Great brands, of course, are built on consistency more than throwing the next new thing out there. Every time we go out there and try to improve a product and try to do that on the 100th new property that we have or the 200th new property that we have, we've just created a huge level of inconsistency between the first and the last. Airlines do it too, but they can refurb an entire fleet in maybe 18 to 20 months if they work really, really hard. Try to do that on 200 hotels, as you know this better than I do, 
that is the number of inconsistencies in the moments of magic that we created all along that way that we tried to improve something, not because we thought it moved the ball closer to the goal or we were answering to a need, but because we thought we were answering to a want that that customer wanted. Right. So making it consistent, being reliable, being trustworthy is what, what it is about. And doing that is simple when you're trying to stick to the basics. Just getting those basics right over and over again. I used to get asked by the press all the time that, you know, and I guess in a sort of a complimentary way that, you know, you run such a complex business. You know, airline business is just so operational. And even now, you know, my, some of my friends say, wow, how do you do this? Two or 20,000 rooms. And I used to say then that, you know, no, actually, all I'm doing is carrying people from point A to point B on time with their bags safely. That's all. That's all I'm doing. Right. What are we trying to do at OYO? We're trying to create safe and secure, clean and hygienic, affordable rooms at a convenient location. Notice I didn't say the best location because we don't believe that there is a best location that is consistent for all the customers. Now here's where I'll probably you know, get a little, little controversial, but I mean, just, just a point of view. I don't have to be right. I'll just give my point of view. Um, Traditionally, the way hotels companies have approached the business is you go look for a great piece of land. And there are few and far between. So that piece of land is only available in a certain location. And then uh, to create economies of scale, we built reasonably large hotels because the number of rooms kind of amortizes the cost and therefore you have great economies of scale. And then to attract people to travel those two hours that that lady said, we've got to make them into destination hotels and really, really attractive and make it really worth their while to drive all the way. But we forgot what the customer actually needs. So. Again, as I said, we don't have to be right or wrong. We just, have, we just have different roles to play in this industry. The way we think about it is we pick the customer first, figure out where that customer is, put a location right next to where the customer is, maybe build a small hotel. But because of the sheer volume of the inventory that we have, that is what is driving the economies of scale. And that allows us to give an affordable price right next to where the customer actually needs. And we don't want them to travel two hours. Actually, we just want them to walk 20 minutes. Just a different approach. Maybe it works for us, maybe it doesn't work for you. But we really feel that, unlike a lot of other companies which are shaking the world up and which we have a lot of respect for, whether it is Google or Facebook or Amazon or Alibaba or Uber, we are actually trying to put the customer in there first at the center and then trying to gradually draw concentric circles around the customer with the product that we have, with the needs that he, need, that he wants to satisfy at the price that he wants, at the location that he wants. And then the tech, the hard work, the problem solving skills, all these MBAs that we have are trying to solve for that hard problem in trying to get that customer what he needs at the price he wants, at the location he finds most convenient in a manner that we can chase profitability and create a great sustainable business. We have halved our losses at OYO year after year after year, and this year we've already given a public guidance that it'll be down to 10% this year. We're just five years old. And, uh, and it is that growth and that chase of profitability, which makes a sustainable business. Because growth at the sake of profitability does not create a sustainable business. So I'm often asked, what's our strategy to stay ahead? None of what I said is new. Anybody who ever went to business school, I didn't, or bought the book Nuts by the famous and great Herb Keller, thinks he knows how to run a low-cost carrier. Everybody's run as has studied the Southwest case study. So what's our strategy to stay ahead? 
I believe, and this is my personal belief, and I, I, I really do have a very, very strong opinion on this, that culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I have huge respect for line employees, even in my previous job. Um, the view from the 40,000 feet level that Manav asked me to give you is, think of this. In this hotel, when we are trying to create con consistency, we have cameras all around. There are four cameras here, maybe more, right? When that plane is flying 40,000 feet up in the air, there are no cameras on board. No one is watching. And it is to create that consistent level of service when no one is watching comes from when the passion and motivation comes from within. So how do we overcome all these challenges? Well, I actually think that challenges are not what one must focus on. It is risks. Challenges are common to all of us. The risks are what are more important. And the risks are internal. The risks are arrogance and complacency. Especially when you're the largest, when you're the leader. And I think we have to constantly, as human beings, as organizations, as teams, have to focus on this. This controlled paranoia that somebody will come and do an OYO on us, somebody will come and do an indigo on us, is I think what keeps us on our toes. That fear of losing this once in a lifetime opportunity is certainly number one in my things that motivate me every day. And who's our competition? Our competition is not each other, frankly. We all know that. Every one of the CEOs, every one of the GMs knows this so well. Our competition is all those things that we failed at yesterday. How do we get a little bit better? How do we take all those shots and give it a try? Because every shot that we did not take is a shot missed. Uh, I think as we, as we kind of you know, look ahead, we have to also kind of try to understand that what are all the things that make a true leader? A leader is someone who has a, has a role that is far above and beyond their job. A leader is someone who empowers all the people around you. There was that question whether the GMs today are as good as the ones of the past. We're comparing apples to oranges, right? We have to understand, and by the way, I think as the hospitality business, you should take this as a great compliment. I used to always give examples of hotel GMs to our airport managers in the airline. The amount of empowerment, the amount of ownership, the amount of accountability that most general managers have almost in any hotel is incomparable compared to the line leaders almost in any other industry. But what we who are leading the business have to recognize is that like we had 20 years to get used to the, to the world that we live in, most, most GMs today have probably four or five. And that wisdom does not come in four or five. So how do we overcompensate as mentors and coaches to bring about that wisdom so that they can perform to the best of their potential? Because the problem solving skills that the youngsters have today, the ability to take chances, and more importantly, that audacity to dream is just unparalleled. I don't think 10 years ago, I would have been able to make you know, all these decisions and try to create the, the crazy you know, scale of businesses that youngsters are creating today. I have a 25-year-old boss today, right? And that 25-year-old boss has an amazing audacity to dream. And to be able to create a, a company which is present in close to 20 countries with over half a million rooms, with close to about 400,000 people to 500,000 people using it every day, fourth largest in China to the largest in Indonesia, finding great talent, great leaders. At 25 years old, I was, uh, I just bought my first Maruti 800. And I felt like I had really you know, achieved something in life, and I, which I did but the world has just completely changed on us, right? And um, that empowerment comes from that ability to make a change in other people's lives, you know? And, um, and I hope 
that we all understand that it is that it is that you know that pursuit of dreams it is that audacity to dream that is what's going to power us ahead i used to always say that uh, that you know as the last question that i used to always ask in all of my interviews was what's your dream and the first answer that would come is uh, you know i want to be a vp or i want to be a ceo and then i used to always ask again no what's your dream what's your personal dream if you're going to sleep at night and dreaming about oyo or indigo or radisson or intercontinental you need to get a life <laughs> seriously <All right. laughs> that dream is to kind of buy that house by the lake or you know send your parents on a holiday or buy a scooter or gifting your father a car or sending your mom on a holiday or something of that sort and every one of us is out there chasing that dream i think organizations today really need to deeply recognize how that individuals chase of that dream makes a deeply profound impact on the future of our organizations that is what keeps people on their toes when no one is watching and there are no cameras on board so so thank you for having me here this morning and i wish you can keep chasing your dream thank you thank you